I now get to use the simulation model which I've just presented and I'm going to use it to look at the fatigue performance of the casing of a live rear axle. And my approach is going to be to do parametric studies and for this I firstly calculate the nominal fatigue life for a base case and then one by one I vary different parameters and see what the effect is on the fatigue life. And it's far easier to do this and to try to calculate the absolute fatigue life where I'd need to simulate the uh, whole service life of the axle. Now the case I really want to look at is for the axle of the Isuzu D-Max which failed on the Canning stop route. But looking into it I just didn't have the necessary data, the axle dimensions, the spring stiffnesses and so forth and so it wasn't possible. I was rather forced to take as my study case the axle of the Land Rover Defender because I've got this myself, I've got the necessary information to hand and where I don't have it I can go out and measure it. And for the sake of the record I show the vehicle mass data and the suspension data. Now the one measurement I had a bit of trouble with was to measure the uh, thickness of the casing and then I found the best way to do it was to take a small bolt with a butterfly nut poke the, the head of the bolt through the axle breather hole tighten up the nut, take it out, measure it with vernier gauge and I found that the thickness was just over 6.5 millimeters. And the last piece of the jigsaw is to decide which SN curve to use. Now as I've shown this depends on the uh, welded details. I had a good look at the welded attachments to the axle. I found them to be quite well detailed, generally welded up with double-sided fillet welds. And where the welds were completely inaccessible, uh, they used mouse holes. And this is the correct approach. And having assessed all of this information, I decided that the correct curve to use was curve E from the DNV code. Now the first thing I wanted to look at was the effect of velocity on the fatigue damage. And I've done the simulation running at various velocities from 10 km per hour up to 100 km per hour over the digital test track. And this is for a Class D road which is a poorly maintained tarmac road or a not very good gravel track. Now I've normalised the fatigue damage to 50 km per hour which is our base case and I compare the other velocities to this and the results are plotted out here. You will see that if we speed up to 80 km per hour the fatigue damage is 2.2 so the fatigue life is worse than half. On the other hand if we slow down to 20 km per hour um, the fatigue damage goes down to 0.12 so the fatigue life has gone up by a factor of about 8. Now I do understand if you're driving on a very long gravel road you want to get in as soon as possible and drive as quickly as conditions allow but bear in mind that it is going to be at the expense of damage to, to the vehicle. Out of interest I wanted to see what speed I actually drive at on roads like this. Now I looked out dash cam footage which I have from a recent trip to Borneo and I have hour upon hour of driving on roads like this and I found that I typically drive between 20 and 30 kilometers per hour. I know I'm an old slow coach but the fact is I am going to arrive safe and with the vehicle in good condition. The next thing I want to look at is the effect of air helper springs because these were used on the Isuzu D-Max which failed on the Canning stop route. Now if you looked at the comments posted against the video as far as many observers were concerned the helper springs were clearly the reason that the axle had failed and there were very colourful comments like you had these pistons hammering their way through the axle. Needless to say no evidence was presented. So let's look at the facts. Now, 
I have our helper springs myself, and so I have the necessary information to hand. You can inflate them to 35 PSI, so for current purposes I've assumed we inflate them to 2 bars, and if you do that, the spring stiffness goes up by about 20%. Now this is probably comparable to what you get if you fitted heavy-duty conventional springs, and many people do that. And the effect on the natural frequencies of the sprung and the unsprung mass, well, they go up by about 10%, which is what you'd expect because they vary with the square root of, of the spring stiffness. And if we run the fatigue calculation, we find that that goes up by around 7%, which isn't a whole lot in reality. However, there's a huge benefit that these air helper springs provide which isn't included in the fatigue analysis. If you're running a heavily loaded expedition vehicle, you will probably find you're bottoming out the suspension from time to time. And when you do that, you put a big shock loading into the suspension and there's a lot of cumulative damage. And if you've got air helper springs and it stops you bottoming out the suspension, that's a really big benefit. I know I'm not going to be changing mine out any time soon. Several of the people who commented on the failure of the Isuzu D-Max rear axle made the comment that these days these Isuzu rear axles are too light. They've been optimised over the years. I thought I'd look into this. Now the Defender rear axle, it's a casting and the two arms of the axle are 88mm OD and 6.7mm thickness. Now we can replace these arms by seamless tube and you can buy the tube at the same OD but only 4mm thickness. And furthermore if you buy the tube in high strength steel with 350 newtons per millimetre squared yield stress you're going to get the same static strength. However the working stresses go up. And if we run the fatigue calc, we see that the relative fatigue life comes down by a factor of four. It's a very worthwhile objective for manufacturers to save weight where they can, and in particular reduce the unsprung mass, but they do this at their peril, and if they over-optimise the axle design, they're going to have a slew of failures to contend with. Another very important factor is the detailing of any welded attachments to the axle casing. Now I looked at the Defender rear axle and found it wasn't too bad. There are quite a few welded attachments, but they are generally fairly fatigue friendly and hence we were able to use Fatigue Curve E, which is about as good as you can expect for this type of component. However, I have seen other axles with much less fatigue-friendly details. And in particular, if you have a plate which is running along the axle, it's going to tend to suck stress from the axle into the plate, and it's very important that at the end of the plate that you get a smooth transition. And if you don't do this, you get a much worse fatigue performance. And you would have to use Curve F, from the um, DNV code. And this is the curve which is highlighted in red. I've rerun the numbers and I find that the uh, fatigue life comes down to less than 30% um, using curve F compared to curve E. It's very important that when manufacturers detail their axles, they bear fatigue performance in mind. The last factor I want to look at is the effect of fitting wider tyres um, to the vehicle. And if you have wider tyres, you normally have to fit wheel spacers as well, so you don't get any, any interference with the inner wheel arch. And this might have been a very significant factor in the failure of the front axle of the Defender 130, which was experienced on the Grizzly and Bear website. Now in their case they fitted 285R16 tyres all round with 50mm wheel spacers. And compared to the standard design this increases the lever arm by 100mm. Now the lever arm is the distance between the centre of the contact patch and the centre of the wheel carrier. 
It's the dimension indicated as LA in the attached sketch. But it's not the only factor. You also increase the unsprung mass, in this case by a minimum of 13 kilograms per corner, and the tar stiffness goes up likewise compared to the standard narrower tar. So for a, a given load applied to the wheel, the tar deformation is going to be lower and more dynamic loads can be put into the axle. And feeding all of these um, effects into the analysis and rerunning the numbers, we find that the fatigue life is reduced by a factor of six. And this is a real game changer. I would also point out that we're going to have significant impact on the life of the wheel bearings too. Well that's it. I've done a number of simulations and computed number of results which are summarized in the attached table. And you can see which factors have a very major impact on the fatigue life of the axle. No one's claiming these numbers are exact but the fact is they provide very uh, interesting pointers as to where the real problem areas lie. I'd also mention in passing that you can get some of these factors acting in combination, in which case the fatigue life can be dramatically reduced. I'll be using these findings in some of the forthcoming videos, both when I'm looking at um, individual failure examples and also when making recommendations about how to reduce the risk of axle failure.